go. Hello, everybody. Oh, no, it's saying that my like internet is not connection isn't great, which is hopefully, hopefully it'll get better. All right. Uh, hi, we're here. We're going to talk about Blood of the Fold. Oh, good. I see. I see an ad coming up. So we're, we're almost there. <sighs> okay. Liana, how are you? Did I finish how... explaining how eggnog is made? Sure. Well, finish <laughs> explaining how eggnog is made. This is the oh. conversation we were having before. <laughs> we are having potent potables this fine evening. We and are. I was explaining to Bethany how <laughs> bourbon smells like Christmas to me because growing up, my dad always made homemade eggnog, which is like extremely alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And my parents would give like a tiny bit mixed into mo mostly milk. So then like bourbon, which is a big component of eggnog, was like a Christmas right taste to me so like now cold bourbon just tastes like christmas to me that's so funny i'm having white wine in my fancy new dragon goblet i mean you could be having water in there and no one would know it's true no one you could have changes. nothing in there and we wouldn't know i could good point hi everybody hey jessica and nora hi priscilla hey hey yes we're ready. It's going to be fun. You made it. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Yeah, the dragon cover is pretty good. <clears throat> I was going to say, it's the, I mean, as usual, the problem with the covers is the people. Like, this does not look like Richard. <laughs> it's no. It's not. No. I think the girl is supposed to be, what's her name? The uh, The sister. The sister? Yeah, I think the girl is supposed to be the sister that tricks him into going to the. Oh, the I thought lawyer. it was the the Duchess, the Countess, the like Queen Lady oh. who's like making moves on him. Oh, I thought it was supposed to be because they described her as having, I think, like red hair or something. I don't know. Who knows? Well, it's not Kaylin, that's for sure. It is definitely not Kaylin. No, no, no. Thank you. Yes, the goblet is fun. It, it will be prominently featured in a secret upcoming video. <laughs> um hello hi 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 everybody glad y'all could join us yes. who it is, is that man is a great question i would also like to know because it's not richard <laughs> richard is but maybe richard is just like an every man and that's I mean, why okay, he looks honestly, different on every cover on the stone of tears cover i don't have it to show you right now but if you can pull it up in your in your mind palace um <laughs> he looked like Pavarotti, and now he's taking a step down and here he just looks like a high school music teacher like, tell me he doesn't look like a high school music teacher. He looks like a zombie. Like, he's got this weird pallor to his skin. Like, he looks like he's been in a classroom all day and hates his life because he's a music teacher. <laughs> or is undead, but yeah. I mean, I mean, fair. It's Kaylin played by the actress on the show who's a natural redhead. Maybe, I mean, in a pink dress, though? I don't know. It seems it's very... very Ariel. <laughs> That's who it is. It's a crossover universe, and it's Richard with Ariel. Oh, Lord. No. Melissa. Mel yes, her name is Melissa. Thank you, Amanda. It's not Marissa? With is an it R? Marissa? Oh, maybe it's Marissa. I think it's, it's Marissa. It's one of those. It's one of those names. Double check if you want. The text of this book really emphasized that Richard is a big dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if I'll find it, but I think, yeah, well, yeah. I'm going to say Marissa. Yeah. It's Melissa Marissa. was close. So Marissa. I mean, Melissa is what sparked my memory of it being okay. Marissa. But I think All it's right. spelled with an E, so it looks more like Melissa, but oh, with an R. Oh, so M-E-R. There we go. You are not wrong, Priscilla. I think all of the books do go on about Richard's height. Okay, but, but they don't talk about his height nearly as much as they talked about his raptor's gaze. <laughs> And you know how you can tell someone is a Rawl? They also have a raptor's gaze. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> I mean, I generally picture, you know how um, Leonardo DiCaprio looked in The Aviator? Mm -hmm. When he was like very like this in The Aviator? That's basically what I picture. That's, I actually, I don't know why I'm saying uh-huh, because I did not see The Aviator. I don't know why I'm I mean, like, he, I think it's like literally like about. on the like poster for the movie is him okay. being like this. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> It's been a year since you read it. Okay. Hi, Matt. Hello. All right. So, Blood of the Fold. Um, what did you rate it this time? Oh, um, so I gave it three and a half. I didn't think about halves, but I gave it a three. Okay. Like, I probably a three and a half because I think it's better than Wizard's First Rule, but. Yeah. So, I gave Wizard's First Rule a four, I think, because there's just things I like about it. This was a four for me, but I downgraded it to 
three and a half. I'm curious to hear what people think in the comments. Um, that's the, somebody agrees with you. I can in the biopic of Leonardo DiCaprio, I can play the aviator era. <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio. Perfect. <laughs> There you go. Uh, Jessica gave it three stars. Okay. So I feel like in general, like I, 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 let's take a quick poll. Anybody who's here, put in the comments. I mean, I was going to say two. like I gave Wizards First Rule and this both three stars, but like they are like the complete opposite types of three stars. Yeah. Because I think that like Wizards First Rule is better paced and is mm. like overall the story. I like it better, but I think the writing is like pretty shit. <laughs> Whereas like this, the writing is better, but like mm -hmm. the pacing is like way off and like the plot is like what yeah i would agree with that like i think i enjoyed wizard's first rule better which is why i gave it four stars but i think valid um okay so priscilla did three and a half rounded down wizard's first rule was also three and a half but rounded up so we're yeah i'm right with you there megan gave it a four liked wizard's first rule more blood is all over the place but still fun yeah i i would agree i do think i, mean, I feel like if is... terry good kinds like writing that he like leveled up to by the time he was writing blood of the fold was yeah. present in wizard's first rule then wizard's first rule would be a clear four or five yeah i agree like the actual writing like the prose is better like even though these books like we talk about them being really episodic and in general like it's too much of an ongoing series for there to really ever be a middle book but blood of the fold feels like a middle book blood of the fold feels like a middle book if if there's anyone that you get that's and that's what i think i was i i feel like i said in my review is this one has a lot of setup for the next book more so than other books do and it's so all over the place i'm like what not are we i feel doing? like not even just set up it's also it's like half of it is like dealing with the repercussions of the previous book and then half mm. of it is setting up the repercussions for the next book so it's like right the first half is like the actual falling action of stone of tears and then the other half is the prologue for temple of the winds <laughs> yes yeah i agree which which you know it was still like I still liked parts of it, but um, I, mean, I still think that like if we take pacing out of the rubric, the writing is better still. Like then it wasn't Wizard's first rule. Mm -hmm. Okay, first time reading was a three and a half. After read it four or five times, three. Fair enough. This was my third time reading this. Third, twice, second. I don't know. Second. For me, this it's two. Two. It is two. This is my second time reading this one. Um. Yeah, I'm like, what What even happened? Like, this book just had so many random... Are we doing non-spoiler? Sure, let's do non-spoiler to start. Um... Is it a... I don't know if the thing I was going to say is spoilery. <laughs> <laughs> I don't... I kind of, I guess. It Wait, does me... have a nip obsession. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. <laughs> that whole thing is so weird. Like the Let me type in the, the private nipples. chat what I was going to say, and you can tell me if you think that that's a spoiler. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, you're not wrong, Jessica. Like, the whole thing of, like, cutting off nipples as, like, a magical means of controlling people is strange, but okay. Weird. Um, the subject of the next book gets snuck into the current book at some point when they mention Temple of the Wind. Oh, did they? I, I think I missed Yeah, that. but they do that. Like, they mentioned yeah. Blood of the Fold in Stone of Tears. They mentioned the Stone of Tears. Good point. Was he always Good does point. That. Um, I think you could talk about that. I don't think that's spoiler, Eliana. Okay. So I was going to say that, like, it, it takes so long for Kaylin to actually be part of the story. Yeah. It's like 60% of the way through. It is far. Yeah. Which, like, after she was such a huge part of Son of Tears, I'm like, where the fuck is Kaylin? <laughs> yeah. Right? And then I'm like, oh, she's And, like, honestly, there. when I was trying Yay, to remember, welcome. I think this is because, like, I remember, I mean, I remember Temple of the Winds pretty vividly, but that's not for good reasons. But um, in general, I feel like I have a decent, like, bullet point memory of each of the books that I can like go back to my mind I'm like okay this is the one where this is the baddie this is the MacGuffin and this is like vaguely what happens and like I can do that for like each of them but for Blood of the Fold I was like I cannot like cheat on this live like I have to read this book for sure not that I haven't but I was like there's no getting around it because I don't remember what happens in Blood of the Fold and it's because what happens in Blood of the Fold? <laughs> like random things it's like a collection of vignettes I mean there are some things that happen that are interesting but like there's not a driving plot really it's like I don't know yeah yeah everybody else everybody's saying they wanted more Kaylin 
Well, I feel like it's because even when we get Kaylin, it's because like he didn't have anything for her to do. Like she's really passive in this book. She just kind of like shows up towards the end to be like, so I'm just expecting Richard any minute now. What? He is not coming. Yeah, it's like... (laughs) It's like okay. Bitcoin didn't think of a plot that could involve her for this book. I think because it's such a middle book, it's like, yeah, I, yeah it's not it's not one of the better ones, I have to say. I mean, I didn't feel like, oh, Terry Goodkind decided to, like, not care about women anymore. And now Kaylin's out of the picture. It just feels no. like he's just kind of like, it feels like 60% of the way through. He's like, oh, shit, um, Kaylin, um, get her in there to do something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we did. I mean, we did get a lot of uh, Sister Verna. I love Verna. I love Honestly, Verna. I think my favorite parts of Blood of the Fold are Verna and Warren. I know. I love them together. Mm. It's and the Na- and Prelate mm. and Nathan. Yes, I love them too. Prelate. Oh. I was also really happy that the Prelate wasn't actually dead, which I kind of remember but not 100%. And I was like I was like, "Wait, what?" Oh, I yeah. Did. Okay. So I I um Which I guess we're talking spoilers. Sorry. I I was gonna say like I forgot um that they faked it but I definitely remember that she's alive so I was like oh I forgot about this contrived murder mystery plot right and like that she's like wait I've been reading all these reports why did we hire the burial people I feel like I feel like like you know when Nathan is like took her long enough like I almost feel like were we ever meant to think like we the audience like clearly verna thinks she's dead but like were we ever really supposed to be with verna on that and just be just as surprised as she is to learn that she's alive because i don't remember ever being surprised by that yeah i don't know because it's not like we see her die and so it's yeah. kind of like i mean oh, honestly now, like yeah i've said it before and i'll say it many times again nobody no death i mean you're not wrong you're not wrong can't wait till we repeat a version of this conversation. I I disagree. I liked. I mean, Pillars of Creation is very slow, but I liked it because it it um, highlights a different character. I just don't remember very much the farther we get into the series, so we'll see. It'll be interesting to see how much of it I actually remember. Well, it's like a, a rare book that doesn't center Richard so much. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Verdine, Bernice. Verdine? No, it's Verdine. Is Verdine? Okay, favorite Mordsith. Oh, yeah. Okay, can we talk about the Mordsith? I had forgotten. So are we officially going off spoilers? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we're talking spoilers. It's fine. Um, I So I really liked and had forgotten that we get queer characters in Blood of the Fold. And it's not, like, horribly done. I mean, it's not the best. But also, like, for a dude writing it in the 90s... I, it, it was a little a little contrived and kind of funny because it's like Richard is like, wait, what? <laughs> like two women? That seems so unnatural. It would is have it felt t- it would have felt more contrived if we hadn't had two books establishing Richard at the absolutely most obtuse, backwards, backwards <laughs> thinking, true. like you know, man and woman in Hutton Forest. Right. Only this. <laughs> it's like anything outside of that. He's like, what? Yeah. So. Well, okay, but I really, I appreciated that he tried to shoehorn in a conversation about what I think was the common rhetoric at this time, like in the 90s, which is like, well, it's just because these women have been hurt by men and that's why their trauma is why they're lesbians. And he and asked think- about that. Well, and they're like, no, I've always liked girls since I was a kid. <laughs> so it kind of pushes back on that a little, which is interesting. And well, I think, I mean, I would happily entertain the opposite argument. It was a risky choice. And I happen to think probably a good choice to make Richard not end that conversation being like, I've, I've you know, I'm fine with it now. You've convinced me a plus like this yeah. is I am for this. But at the end of the conversation, he's like, I still think that's weird and I don't get it, but I don't have to get it. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, maybe, maybe he'll get it someday. But he's like, you know what? It doesn't matter if I don't get it. It's not about me. It's not my life. Like, you know, you do you. Like, whatever. Like, I can't pretend like that doesn't weird me out. But like, whatever you do. Yeah. So like, I think that's a more believable amount of progress for him to make in one conversation. I agree. But then I love how at the end, Kaylin's like, what? You didn't pick up on that already? (laughs) Well, Kaylin's always the one like schooling him on every single culture. Everybody knew that they were clearly together. But also the Midlands oh, has great. just like a variety of approaches to various like cultural norms. And yeah. Kaylin's if Kaylin's not there to tell Richard, hey, don't look at people like you think it's weird because that's offensive. Mm-hmm. If she's <laughs> hasn't been there this whole book. So he got to be all like narrow minded. Yeah. 
thought, yeah, I just thought that was interesting because I had completely forgotten that whole thing existed. So I was glad to see that. Warren is an OG cinnamon roll. I love it. Warren is the great. Yes, we all I love Warren and Warren. Because I have forgotten <clears throat> which of the Mord Sith yeah. were a couple, but I remembered that there was a Mord Sith couple. Yeah. The Mord Sith were hilarious, honestly. I mean, their whole thing of like, you should say this because you talked to me about this in like, <laughs> like in our chat earlier. <laughs> What did I say? You were talking about how, like, the Mordseth are kind of like, well, <laughs> like, we're not free. And he's like, no, you're free. Go. Oh, I think, yeah, when we were talking uh, <laughs> with Mara about how yeah. um, his whole thing, especially at the end of Stone of Tears, is like, I freed you. And they're like, yeah, we're here to serve you. And he's like, no, I freed you. And they're like, yes, and we freely choose to serve you. And he's like, no, well, if you're going to serve me, then I order you to go away. And they're like, no, but you freed us so we can ignore that order. And yes. Still gonna serve you. <laughs> Dang it! Yeah, <laughs> using my logic against me. Honestly, the it's part that like made it. me like, I mean, the more so they're funny, but the yeah. part that actually made me like out loud chuckle <laughs> was the part where I think it's mm -hmm. Kara explaining everything that went into the cream that she got for his itch, and he's like, "I wish you told me that before you before I put it on." <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh, Richard is so... I could just hear him being really deadpan about that. <laughs> like, wish I'd known that. It was like a very Han Solo kind of like... Yeah. What I was picturing. Yeah. yeah. Priscilla, I think this is true. Richard still doesn't get it, but it's okay because friend, friendship is the most important thing for Richard. It felt... Yeah, I, I agree. That is... I think that is true. He's totally like... There was a lot of Richard just like relating present events back to Westland days like there's like the kid that's drowning and the mom that drowns to try to get him there's mm -hmm. the friend that had a wife that Richard didn't approve of and he lost that friend like he yeah. reflects on you know mm -hmm. his young days a lot yeah yeah his 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 pre-wizardy days and yeah no which which I I appreciate that he's like look I may not get it but you, you just do what you're going to do. It's like, in fairness, Richard, there's yeah. a lot you don't get, so. <laughs> I like how Kara told Richard he could keep Caitlin because he likes her. <laughs> she likes her. Yeah, that's true. Oh, man. Well, and how, like, Caitlin is total, and part of the thing is, is that Caitlin is so not phased when they try to, like, like, make her jealous at the end. And she's like, okay. She's like, clearly you two are together. I'm not worried. <laughs> Sure. Uh, because Caitlin is the best. I'm saying because we know that Caitlin has the capacity to be jealous. Marissa made her jealous, but the right. Mordsith did not succeed. No, <laughs> saw right through that one. Uh, other things. This book is just like I'm, I'm saying. I mean, it might make sense to just because there is no like plot. There's no like particular theme mm -hmm. like if we just kind of go through it more or less chronologically okay it, it's just like no other guiding principles to take right. us through this <laughs> <laughs> i mean there is a lot i mean because it is a middle book then like yeah. the main thing that i appreciate in this book and i think i like it it's better the first time because it's new information the second time you're like okay yeah i mean i know this but like learning about like the stuff he finds in the wizard's keep and learning about mm -hmm. like what more about like the old timey wars that created the towers about how jagang's magic works right about, the whole dream like, there's like a lot of like the lore type stuff that like it is set up but it's also like interesting it is tidbits and you feel a bit like richard and Berdine who are like we're putting the scholarly pieces together mm -hmm. well and the fact that he's like oh crap i thought i was doing a great thing getting rid of these wizard towers in the last book but oops it let in the dreamwalkers and i just screwed up everything but at the same time like if he hadn't done that the world would have ended so like also true also true like, like they literally were trying to navigate the, him towards the prophecy where he does destroy those towers because right. like we'll deal with jigang in a world that still exists as opposed to just the end of all yeah. things <laughs> you kind of can't you kind of can't win which is like the same thing that not about the towers but i mean when richard comes back to Iden drill so i said to go chronologically but we're gonna go reverse order back mm -hmm. to front <laughs> so end of the book when richard is like you know my I, I my messed up and I did everything wrong and he's all like down in the dumps about it for days and she's like cheer up <laughs> and he's like no I violated the wizard's third rule and she's like okay 
but let's play what if. Like, what if you hadn't done any of the steps that you did? Would things have ended well? No. So, like, was there were there negative consequences also? Yes. But, like, mm-hmm. if you had done anything differently, we would have been, like, the net result at the end of everything would have been, like, very much worse. Right. Uh, yes, they were. <laughs> Also, yeah. like, it's hinted at that there's incest happening between them. It is more is, like, hinted at. Well, yeah. It's not on page, though. Yeah. Small mercies. <laughs> um, I always was oh. sad that, like, in Stone of Tears, Pasha, and in Blood of the Fold, um, Lunetta didn't have, like, redemption arcs. Yeah. They're just dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean... Sometimes the world is cruel. I know, but it's like seems specifically these like female characters that like are also victims of circumstance that just die. Yeah. Because like Pasha wasn't really a villain. Lunette is not really a villain. Yeah. They're victims. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're not wrong. Um, like how they set up the hatred for magic that starts to pop up. Yeah, that's true. We do get a lot of that. Um, yeah. This is also reminding me of some things that I think happen later in the series. I don't, like, it's more vague to me, so I'm not... I was the part that I actually, I remembered it <laughs> distinctly, but I did not remember that it was in Blood of the Fold, was, mm-hmm. like, all of the Sisters of the Dark in the tent meeting Jagang, and, like, that. I remembered that very well. And then I was, I, I think I had placed it in my mind in Temple of the Winds, but it obviously mm-hmm. it's in this one. Yeah. I had remembered the uh, Countess with the gl- the glamour. I did not remember that. I was like, oh my. Oh, God. I did. You know why, though, is because I feel like those, like, like, because I read them as a teenager and, like, those scenes of her, like, seducing Richard with food are, like, imprinted in my, like, sexual awakening brain. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I remember this. <laughs> I did not remember and now that. I'm, and now I'm like, oh, this was really creepy. <laughs> yeah. It's also like, I love that two seconds after we start to see Richard being like, I'm kind of into you. Like the very next chapter, we learn about some sorceress that got in trouble for using glamours. Glamour. And because that's and basically, like, oh, but it's like tantamount to, but they like literally say it's tantamount to rape. And, right. and then you're like, oh, so that's what's happening, Richard. He's yeah. being raped. Right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. Because that's never happened to Richard before. <laughs> it, yeah, I guess it kind of is, but like it, it, I don't, it, I didn't remember the circumstances as much, but I remembered like viscerally those, like those scenes. So. I mean, I feel like um, we already, we get Kaylin and the apple in Wizard's First Rule. That's true. That was um, consensual. That is accurate. <laughs> like to take a moment to appreciate Warren nerding out about Jala with Vernon. I don't remember this. Well, when she's like, where is everybody? And he's like, oh, yeah, this is like while you were gone. Um, the Emperor's big deal is like this game called Jala. And like everybody oh. like goes to play it. And he like basically explains the World Cup to her. A World okay. Cup with death. You know what? <laughs> I was listening to the audiobook, And so in my head, that is not how it was spelled. <laughs> oh, that's- <laughs> so that's that's why I'm like. Because I think they pronounce it differently. Mm-hmm. Ja- Jala? I think they say Jala. I don't know. Anyway, th- this is why. It's because it's not pronounced. Yeah. That, you know what I think is funny is how at the end, Richard is like. Jala Rawl. Yeah. But he's like, he's also like, let's make a more family friendly version of this game where people don't get hurt and undermine the blood games thing that the mm-hmm. Emperor is trying. He basically has like the safety scissors equivalent of the ball <laughs> in the Rawl version of yeah. Jala. It's great. Well, it, um, at the same thought, I thought it was Jello. Yeah. There you go. I'm glad I'm not the only one who was like, the what? <laughs> yeah. If you listen to the audiobook, it's like very different. Um, I'm trying to, I feel like there yeah. were some words, not Jala, but like that I was like being like, I wonder how that would be said out loud. Mm. I'm not thinking of any, but I'm sure there were because there's a lot of, you know, very 
silly names that are not actually names, but there's also some namey names. Yeah, that's true. I think it's interesting the game, though, is clearly, like, sort of his version of, like, gladiator games as a way of keeping people happy. But it's like soccer meets rugby also. Right, but except that people, like, torture each other if they're the losers at the end. Yeah, but it, it to me, it reads more like, I don't know, like, football culture in yeah. the UK, where it gets, yeah. like, into, like, rioting after. Oh, interesting. Yeah, maybe. I guess when I was reading it, I was thinking, like, Roman gladiator games as a way of appeasing the people and keeping them from pushing back I mean, I think the, role. like, the plot purpose of, like, why he sets those games up is very similar to that, but, like, mm-hmm. the when he describes the games and how people act around the games reminded me mostly of like soccer, AKA football in the that UK. Makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Warren's breakdown of power to use sport to distract the masses. Exactly. Yep. Warren nerds explaining sports. Mm-hmm. The whole thing of like the Mriswith in this is kind of creepy. Like is Richard Skin turning, brother. Like, is he turning into one? Because he has, like, that's scaly patches. Yeah. Like, that's what it reads to me. And that's like. why Burdine is like, take the cloak off. Take the cloak off. Yeah. So, like, were they just wizards that wore these cloaks for too long? That's what it sounds like. Maybe. Yeah. And where does the queen come from? But Because she, she hatches more, I guess. Well, because, like, I mean, what? this whole thing was, like, created by wizards uh, to, like, combat whateverness. So, like, I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. Um, yes. Yes. Priscilla, exactly. Bread and circuses. Um, what happened? I'm like trying to think like what chronologically even. Well, I mean, I think I loved that for throughout these books, we keep getting. Um, like it keeps getting rem- or brought up again the adventures of bonnie day and about mm-hmm. how nathan purposely left multiple different translations of it and it was like this might help you if you know this book by heart already to have yeah translations of it i'll just leave these here for later yeah and now they're using those yeah i also thought it was interesting how even though the countess is being used to try to like then kill like assassinate richard he just like fully t- takes advantage of like her like yeah sure to like sign all these papers i just wanted to make this easy for you even while he's being clever <laughs> and how she's like i thought we would look these over later he's like i cleared it with your peeps already and she's like great okay <laughs> i guess i'll sign them now <laughs> yep. yep yep but on a more serious note like I think this bothered me then and it definitely bothers me now a lot more. Well, I haven't reread it yet, so we'll see how I feel. But I've often, I mean, I've said multiple times that Faith of the Fallen was my favorite and Faith of the Fallen is the one that everyone points to as being like, oh, that's the one where he got political. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, but like, when was he not political? <laughs> like, uh, yeah. I think he started there. But yeah. um, I'm more uncomfortable with Richard strong manning like all of the Midlands under the banner of Dahar and saying only, you know, like, no, only surrender no negotiation mm. you will be like it's like soviet rule yeah and dahara is like red and so having this like red army that is like you are under you are part of us now and that's it and i'm like are we for this yeah um, i mean I that's like true this. well and then he's like nervous writing to kaling he's like i hope you're not mad at me and she's kind of like oh, i understand <laughs> which like i mean yeah. I don't, it's not like I'm reading it and going, like, that there was, like, I have in mind a different solution, like, Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think the point he's trying to make is that war is messy, and, like, there's even, you know, Richard has conveniently the opportunity to make a speech about, because there's some people that's like, well, what if we're, like, pacifists and we don't want to fight? And he's like, cool, you don't have to fight, you can still help, you don't get to sit by and enjoy the protections that we die bringing you, so, like, I get that, but it's also, like, it's just, I don't know, the way it's framed is very, like, Napoleon, Stalin, Hitler. <laughs> Don't love it. I mean, you're not, yeah. You're and then Richard wrong. has to keep saying over and over and over, like, I'm not doing this to aggrandize myself. I'm not doing this because I want to gain power. And I'm like, if you have to say that that much. 
I mean, the only reason it works is that we know him well enough to know that he isn't. But, like, but no like, one else knows that. And, like, right, if anybody is else why... is doing it, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that he's playing countries against each other of, like, you will not be able to trade the goods that you need and to survive. The thing of that is that, I mean, we've talked before about just how, like, no one is the villain of their own story. So, like, no strong man who's been, like, you un- like gathering a bunch of land under their own. I mean, the Romans did that. And they were like, well, we're bringing Roman betterness to everybody. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that people didn't feel that way. But like R- Richard being like, I'm improving things this way. Like, I believe I'm helping. You're like, okay, but you're still the drama. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Pres- exactly. What about when there's another all who isn't benevolent? Yeah. That is the problem with benevolent dictators is like you it don't. It works for like one generation. <laughs> right. It just, it's not an ongoing solution. Um, we have a couple people who are saying it, they were disappointed that the dragon on the cover wasn't actually a dragon. I mean, honestly, like this just looks like Scarlet. Like this is not how the Merce with Queen is No, described. it doesn't. It does look like Scarlet. That is, I think it probably I'm is. I'm like, think, why? <laughs> why is Scarlet on this cover? She's not even in the book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Yes, Miss Ruth Swifts are yes. Oh, they're very creepy. They are creepy. And honestly, one of the things that I feel like, I mean, I enjoyed The Legend of the Seeker show. I don't think it's a good adaptation of these books, but by itself is like a very entertaining show to watch. Yeah. And I think that genuine, because most of it looks pretty like silly. And it's like, you know, a daytime <laughs> fantasy show in the, mm-hmm. uh, the likes of Xena, the warrior princess and Hercules. So like, it's not you know, premiere television like Game of Thrones. It wasn't trying to be and it never was gonna be. But yeah. the way that they did the Merce with, like they are very creepy. Like I don't remember. They are very I'm creepy looking. You watch it at some point. That's interesting. Yeah. And they they're basically exactly how I picture the Merce with <laughs> in the books. Interesting. Yeah, this is interesting. The very end we find out Zed can take off his Radahan. Yeah. Yep. Why does that make so much sense? Well, I don't know. I mean, it does seem like something where maybe if you had enough control of your power and understanding of how the world works, it wouldn't work on you. Maybe. I'm trying to remember what they said. Because when like, Richard is like, I want it, you to take it off. And like, we literally can't until you learn to use your power and you do it yourself. But I couldn't remember if they said you have to do it yourself or if like you can do it with us. And Leanna, without your help, we can't do Leanna, it. Leanna, you know what it is? It's the wizard's first rule. Oh, people will believe a thing because they're afraid that it's true. Because, because they're they afraid it's true. Or, yeah. Kisas, kisas. I bet that's it. But I mean, I it, it worked on Warren and on Nathan. Yeah. But does it work on Nathan, though? I don't know that I buy that it actually does. I don't remember. Because, like, I don't know. I mean, I guess we'll see. I just feel like Nathan is the kind of person who can do whatever the hell he wants to do and make it happen. I, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, yeah. But, like, he the, the amount he bitches about being killed captive for a thousand years. I mean, that's true. But I think he just Gratch enjoys, lady enjoys doing that. Gratch is a lady. Yes. True, true. Uh, okay, we saw that. Yes, yes. Yes, we love Gratch's family. Um... Interesting that a sister, I think you may be right. We haven't talked about the Sisters of the Dark. So let's talk about the Sisters of the okay. Dark. Okay. <laughs> uh, because like the whole thing of like I had forgotten how creepy the Emperor is with like the rings. It's not nearly stuff. as creepy as what they do to become Sisters of the Dark in Stone of yeah. Tears. True well. story, but still <laughs> it's disturbing. Yeah. Um and I think it's interesting that now they're sort of like, we will temporarily be your allies, Richard, just to defeat him. Well, I also think that Jagang is a much more interesting villain than Dark and Rawl could ever be. Yeah. Um, and I'm really glad that, like, it kind of shifted to not being always Dark and Rawl and being Jagang. Because the idea, like, as it's pointed out many times in the book, he isn't actually very powerful. He doesn't mm-hmm. actually have any power. It's just the power he has over you. Right. And the fact that he can influence people who have power makes him powerful. 
And I think that's just so much more nuanced and interesting as a villain than just like Dark and Raw, who's like, I am a powerful wizard who right. can do anything. Right. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. Okay, Thanos. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I think he makes for a really interesting villain. And I I also think, I don't know, what do you think of this whole fix that like the Dreamwalker can't get inside your head because of the magic of the Raw bond if you well, like since, again like the blood of the like we said or like what i said earlier is that the one interesting thing about blood of the fold is that like it gives you lots of like lower history type of building so like what richard finds out in the keep about like the merce with and about the sliff and about mm-hmm. um all this kind of thing and also when he learns about like okay so like when he learns about the bond he's like the fuck why and then yeah. when he learns the origin of the bond like it makes sense like it was it was done with a purpose just like how the gars were invented in response to the merce with and how right. the raw bond was invented in response to the dreamwalkers and how like these are all reactions and that's why we have these magics they're not just like arbitrarily powerful evil magics that somebody created one day because they were like i'm evil and i'm making an evil magic it's like unintended consequences and like repercussions down the line when like we're just trying to make a weapon to fight this war and then like down the line that mm-hmm. becomes trickier Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I guess my question about it is that at first it seemed like the bond only worked with people who were Daharan or had Daharan blood, but now it seems like it's just extending to anybody, right? I guess my reading of it was that like, it's like automatic if you're Daharan, whereas if you're anybody who's not Daharan, you have to like actively choose it. Interesting. Because, like, he created it to protect his people back in the day. So you inherited that protection if your, like, great-great-great-great-grandpappy was a part of it. Um, But, like, great-great-great-great-grandpappy opted into it and you inherited it. So, Right. But they do still have to do, like, the whole, like, Lord Rawl, like, like, whatever it is, the, like, prayer thing. I think that people who opt in, they can't, like, feel a bond. Like, they can't feel him near and they can't, like, it's, like... I think it's more for the Daharans. Like, they can't disobey him. They can feel him near, as mm-hmm. opposed to just being protection against the Dreamwalker. Which is interesting. Interesting. Uh, watch party. <laughs> uh, that'd be fun, maybe. Also, um, the actual best... Wait, okay, there's two... The two best parts of the show were the guy who played Zed and uh-huh. the girl who played Kara. I haven't seen the show in such a long time. It would be kind of fun to like watch an episode or two. We could talk about. I really liked the actress who played Kara. She was yeah. very Kara energy. We, we could, when we're done with all of this, like talk about doing a, a watch party for a couple episodes at some point. But Kara doesn't come in until season two. And it's in season two that they dress Zed up as a duchess and bring him into a castle. (laughs) I am not doing watch parties for that many episodes. (laughs) And we just skip to the episode where they dress Zed up as a duchess. (laughs) That's true. We could do that. Oh, man. Um, Yeah. Okay. I definitely read these before the show came out. Let's do a watch. People want to watch party. We'll see. We'll see. We'll talk about it. It makes this sense because you said- Legend of the Seeker was the first show I ever binged watched on Netflix. Wow. Because it was one of the few things back in the day, like streaming wasn't their big thing. So they had yeah. a few things. Yeah. And that was one of the things they had. So I was like, sure. Yeah. Um, makes sense because he's the first wizard and how he explains his work. Huh. Maybe. Maybe. This is the Wizard of the First Order. I I still think this is this is my theory. My theory is that it's the Wizard's first rule that he can't get it off because he's afraid that what they told him is true. Which would definitely be the case. I with think Richard. that Terry Goodkind just wrote it any kind of way that made sense for the scene and was like, <laughs> because he is the powerful wizard, so it doesn't apply to him because <laughs> that's how I'm writing it. Is what I think. I mean, that is possible, but I think you could also make an argument for Richard also having the ability to get it off, but Wizard's first rule because of his trauma with uh, Denna making him There's scared. You know? Literally every wizard, like, again, also Warren, also Nathan, like, yeah. <laughs> I, look, 
if you're told a thing well there's plenty that like wanted to try to get it off well but if they and they didn't have richard's trauma right but like if they believe that they what they've been well the other thing you have to realize right is like most of these were brought in as boys like as children yeah. And so, like, they if they were taught from the time they were children that, like, the only way this can be taken off is when you prove yourself and a sister does it, like, you tend to believe stuff you're taught as a child, right? I'm, I'm just, just saying, saying I don't think it's that deep. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. Well, we can disagree. It's fine. Um, okay. Jessica agrees with you first and then me, but that's fine. You said most of the time, Terry, Terry Goodkind's lore building, it goes to a point, and then he's like, but Richard is special. I but mean, Kaylin like, is special. That is but Zed is special. True. Like, okay, so like, no rules apply. That's kind of true. Jagang has brains as well as Bron. Yeah. He's creepy, though. Um, yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I mean, we have, we've like danced around Broken and Lunetta. Because most of the book is kind of about them. Yeah. They are the blood of the fools. <laughs> right. That's true. I guess I just didn't find them that interesting. Like, because they kind of. I do think, I mean, like, just the way that, um, you know what it reminded me? Because obviously this couldn't possibly have occurred to me when I first read it. But um, the way that Brogan. Um, you probably will. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, Temple of the Winds lives in my brain, but not any like actual lore. Just a very specific just part. Just a very of it. specific part. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't be shocked if you're right. But uh, I don't. I don't. I'll just be vague because in case someone hasn't seen this, I don't want to spoil it. But like the way that Brogan um, justifies to himself the voice he hears in his head and is like, "Oh, it's the it's the creator," and then the Merce with her like with him, so they are also servants of the creator and like this makes sense it very much reminded me of midnight mass yes yes i agree that's so that's that's all i'll say in case someone yeah. hasn't seen midnight, midnight mass. mass is really interesting it's a really good show um and another reason i wish lunetta wasn't dead is because i kind of i do want to know more about like why did their mom keep saying that he's the one? And like, how mm-hmm. did the pretty clothes all like both make her ugly and make him not use his magic? Like, I have so many questions. <laughs> pretty. Yeah. Because I... as soon as her, her pretties, not actually pretty clothes, but like her pretties, as soon as they burn, her glamour gets like revealed. So like she's now, you can see what she really looks like. She's pretty. And he now has access to his magic and he starts just, like, lightning everywhere. Like, um, like Palpatine just, like, losing control. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm guessing it's something her mother wove together, where her mother maybe made the pretties. And well, like, I get what, how it would like, make her, help her, like, sh- create a glamour to make her change her appearance. But, like, why would it affect his ability to access his own magic? It's not touching him. It's not part of him. Well, I think... I think she i don't know if it's all totally connected but like i do know that like we know that she was constantly using her magic like she never stopped which was unusual and uh like so i think something she was doing was suppressing his magic so in addition to maintaining the glamour she was actively suppressing his magic yeah so the the pretty like an amplifier and she couldn't that's what it. I think. That's my mom. suspicion that their mom created the pretty. Well, they said that the mom created it. I just didn't understand. I got that they would help with the glamour. I was right. just like, how does that affect him? Yeah, I'm guessing that it's some kind of an amplifier or something that like helps her continuously project it because like there was a mention where someone noticed like hey it's weird like she's always using magic. Which oh, is a lot unusual. of people noticed that. I just yeah. again like I didn't. I yeah. didn't get why that would make him not have access to his magic. Right. That's my that's my theory. But I don't know. Um Yeah. Yeah. 
And like, if she thought that Brogan was like the one, as she told Dunetta, is it because he was just like unusually strong with the gift, or because prophecy, or because because why? I don't know. But yeah, when you called the creator a bandling, I was like, okay. <laughs> I think we have lost it. Uh, like a web. Yeah, yeah. Because she never changes out of the. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, clearly not. Well, yeah. Save, I mean, was safe from him how? Like, from his magic? Maybe. But, like, from other things? No, clearly not. Although it se- Yeah, that's true. Although it seems like, it seems like she would, like, well, but maybe safe from him killing her. It seems like he kept her around just because she was useful. Like, he didn't seem like he wanted to kill her. Yeah. But yeah, but speaking of um, beliefs, I told, I messaged you this, that like oh, when yeah. Richard is like hearing all of the stuff that people believe about the new Lord Raw, that he has like child sex slaves and then he kills children and that like all these like ridiculous things. And that like when I first read this book and it, there's a bit of that in Stone of Tears with the stuff they accuse Kaylin of. Yeah. Um, when I read first read these books, I was like, okay, like I, I know what he's getting at, but like that's a, a little exaggerated. But living in a post QAnon world, I'm like, it's not even exaggerated. People really believe stuff like this. Oh, I mean, oh no, oh no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It does kind of make me wonder if stuff like that was going on in like the early '90s, because I would have been too young well, to really I think be aware the reading. Of it. I think the reading people, most people gave of these books is that he was commenting on like McCarthyism. That makes sense. And I mean, history is pretty cyclical. It's not like yeah. the stuff we've seen. Like, I mean, it's always unprecedented in terms of like, it's like a new version of it, but mm-hmm. the stuff we've seen nowadays is just like, it's, it's like the new mutation of the coronavirus. Like it's still coronavirus, but it's just like the new version. Right. That makes, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, when Kaylin does come back into it, she's just bamfy. She and Richard get to escape together. They yeah. do a little Indiana Jones style slide in just in the last second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we'll get a lot more of Kaylin in the next book. I mean, honestly, the every like the whole that whole thing of like Richard and Kaylin destroying the palace of the prophets and escaping just in time was the most like adventure serial adventure of the week TV show of it all. Yeah. It's true. Well and now Warren is a burgeoning young prophet himself. So also, I mean we talked before uh, in Stone of Tears about how like, you know, Kaylin goes to war and Richard goes to wizard school. And like what a fun subversion that is of like the usual male female roles. Mm-hmm. Same Mar- uh, Warren and, and Verna. Instead of mm-hmm. having the girl be like, I don't see your wrinkles. You're beautiful to me. It's Warren saying yeah. that to Verna and saying like, I don't see age. You're beautiful to me. Which I like. And I mean, the reality is, is that technically she's still a lot older than him in terms of years lived. But like, you know she looks a lot older so it's an interesting way of getting around like but i don't don't think she is a lot older i think because they talk about when they were both young and how like she kind of had a crush on him it didn't say and he had a crush on her and and then she just like aged up outside of palace magic right yeah yeah i liked that i thought it was cute um yeah it's true I mean, it's also, yes. it's like, I mean, it's pointed out that, like, the Daharans were, like, in league with the people Kaelin was fighting in Stone of Tears. Mm-hmm. And so, like, to have, be like, okay, but Daharans are good now. You're like, yeah. okay, I mean, not ever, most people are still going to associate those uniforms and that name with, like, it's like if, uh, yeah. I don't know, it's like if Captain America took over from Stalin and was like, just same uniform, same name, but, like, right. we're good guys now. It was like, pretty sure I still associate the yeah. Soviet Union with bad things. Right. So, yeah. Ah, uh. <laughs> yep. Um, the sliff, yes, the sliff was introduced. What did you think about the sliff? I mean, I remember the sliff, so like, I, I was just like waiting. I was like, okay, do get figure it out. Just, we're gonna do the thing. <laughs> yeah, the sliff is interesting. Um, and 
I don't remember a lot about what ends up happening with the Slith, but it seems important. Well, I mean, it's that... a very convenient plot device. So, like, in later books when they need to travel real quick, real far, they use the Slith. Right. But also, somebody died and they left them in the Slith, right? Isn't that? Mm-hmm. And they became part of them. I mean, I feel like there's a point at which, and it might be in Tumble of the Winds, when Richard is, like, questioning like who created the slip and like the moral implications because the slip is like fine then i am absolved of responsibility because you just said you knowingly did it and you took it upon yourself that you killed this person it's not my fault mm-hmm. um so i think he does question at one point the morality of the slip doesn't have moralities at a moral neutral um, right but like mainly it's a plot convenience <laughs> It is like uh, we've leveled up to where we can just automatically portal from. I mean, so it's like the last season of Game of Thrones. They all suddenly had slips and they were able to teleport (laughs) across all of Westeros in one episode. Yeah. Well, this is like, I guess that's the thing is like for a long time, that was a common thing in RPG video games too, where it's some, where at first you have to walk everywhere, but eventually you level up to the point where you can teleport. So like, it's also like a gaming convention. (laughs) Um, yes. Grand Warren. Yep. People seem to universally love the Sliff. I mean, I oh, just right. Marissa also... died in the Sliff. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Because she followed. In future books. Because yeah, you can't have, and I think that presents problems, I mean, even more than it just did, where, like, you can't carry objects of magic in the Sliff. So, like, obviously right. he couldn't bring a sword of truth, and I think in later books when he needs to travel, it's one of those, like, tough decisions where he's like he needs to get there real fast but like they have this object of magic that they need to get there real fast right. so like what do they do and like right. that kind of thing yeah that makes sense um priscilla i'm kind of with you i this the sliff kind of freaks me out too because i feel like it's a little chaotic like i don't trust the sliff well the sliff feels the most i don't know I don't mean to make this sound like a compliment, but it's the most sci-fi thing about it because it, it reminds me a lot more of the types of things that are in sci-fi where it's like yeah. this, like, I mean, even it's the like Quicksilver thing of it. Type thing. Yeah, and the Quicksilver yeah. imagery is very mm-hmm. Matrix. Yeah. Like when Neo touches the mirror and mm-hmm. it like covers him in Quicksilver, like. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I'm looking forward to seeing more of Nikki, but that's also because Me Nikki too. is one of the main characters in Faith of the Fallen. <laughs> Nikki is interesting. And then I am low-key curious about the Nikki Diaries spinoffs. Chronicles, no? Chronicles. I don't know. I, I think, think it's Diaries. Chronicles. Nikki Chronicles. It might be Chronicles. Yeah. Because that sounds more badass than Diaries. <laughs> yeah. You're right. It does. <laughs> hey, Michael. Yeah. It is interesting. I think what's weird, too, is, like, they have to get into it and breathe it in, mm-hmm. but then they have to remember to, to like, get it out of their lungs when they get out of it. Otherwise, they'll suffocate. It's, yeah, it's interesting. And there is a lot of rhetoric in these books, which, like, the Sliff, obviously, is part of that, um, about uh, where does moral responsibility lie? Does it lie in an object that is able, that enables you to commit violence, or does it lie with the wielder of the object? Because mm-hmm. um, that's the conversation all the time around like Richard and the sword and around magic itself when like the blood of the fold and all of the like narrow minded, the the alt right, mm-hmm. how they want to destroy magic. <laughs> and they're like, it's evil. And they're like, uh, I think Richard and I think a lot of people make the argument that like, no, like magic is magic. And then like there's evil people that use magic and evil ways. And like, mm-hmm. again, like in the context of this book, I agree. But if we're reading it as guns don't kill people, bad people kill people with guns, then I'm like, okay. Not same, though. <laughs> oh. oh, man. Um, yes, living tools are always trouble. I agree. It's like the AI the AI problem. Well, I think it's... Um, I always find these the most interesting have when they seen are the abyss i have not seen the abyss no but whenever these and it's usually in sci-fi this types of things that's why it reminds me of sci-fi is like when people talk to or use something again usually in sci-fi and the sliff is like like how 
or is like the like the software in the spaceship that you are you know talking to or mm-hmm. it is the android that is like voyaging with you and is like programmed supposedly to help you mm-hmm. and they regard it as like this like neutral it's like talking to a sentient wall where you're just yeah. like I don't have to worry about like what you see I don't have to worry about what I make you do because like you're just here to help me and I don't like they don't think about it and always in sci-fi it it comes back to bite you not always in the same way it's not like every sci-fi then it would be predictable but sometimes it'll be like oh they're more um like they have more agency than you'd realize like they actually have opinions about this or it'll be like okay the way you interpreted the like directive to be neutral is like not actually how it's written like the, mm-hmm. they'll all be like oh well you're coded to like not hurt me but the actual directive is to be neutral or something like that mm-hmm. and so then it a neutral directive is not the same as a not hurt you directive. So like, right. they'll always be like, what d- assumptions did you make about this thing that you actually don't understand? And so how did you do with it? How did you treat it? How did, what did you trust it with mm-hmm. that based on those assumptions? And that's always when it becomes the most interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I'm like, I don't know if it's like the fact that I, I normally don't have more than like one glass of wine in a day and I've had two and I feel like I'm it's like making me more tired than I normally so much practice (laughs) drinking for like three hours straight with Jimmy and Alex talking about a song I I just like I cannot I'm usually like at this point I'm usually like I'll have like a glass of wine sometimes but I had one earlier vlogging watching Bridgerton and then I had like a little bit for this and I'm like I I mean I'm not a, a wine drinker but the times that I have had wine I find that it makes me feel sleepy and disgusting. <laughs> yeah, if I have, yeah, it, I think it makes you sleepier. And also, if I have too much of it, I think that's, that's accurate. I do I like wine, though. But... Stick to whiskey. <laughs> there you go. Um, if somebody who read the Nikki Chronicles liked them, but they went too quickly. Okay. Interesting. I don't know. Like, I don't know that I have a lot more to say about this well i think we've been harsh on this book and i just just to be positive for a second i do i did keep thinking because i keep trying to read these books now as like okay um you know try to take off nostalgia goggles um Mm -hmm. like what what would i think of these if i was reading them for the first time now and how do they stack up next to series that are much more well regarded like, is it fair? Is it that, like, do I enjoy them, but they are demonstrably worse than those? Or yeah. is that not fair? Or is it, you know, like, try to be as objective as I can be, which is always impossible with anything, with any art that you consume, no matter how experienced you are. But um, there are just, like, so many things in these books that I cannot help but constantly compare them in my mind to Brandon Sanderson, who is an author that is very, very popular and who does not work for me. And, like, mm-hmm. and... I mean, I get very heated about it, but it is also like it's not necessarily an objective flaw. Like it's it just it clearly does not work for me. And so yeah. people always like to like, I mean, like literally someone commented when I was reading was his first rule and it was like, oh, my God, what she gives us a higher rating the way of kings. And I'm like, I mean, I already did. Um, <laughs> so like, as like that being the standard by, you know, this is like everybody agrees, like he's the king of fantasy and that like this is the he's famous for writing excellent magic systems and like Mm -hmm. this is the standard we measure fantasy against especially high magic fantasy and i don't read high magic fantasy except for sort of truth really like i like grimdark fantasy i like low magic fantasy i very rarely read and even more rarely like high magic fantasy Mm -hmm. and sort of truth is extremely high magic fantasy and so like i'm again like i'm constantly trying to assess it on some kind of objective (laughs) metric or at least figure out why this does work for me and why the other doesn't when the other is much more well regarded and much more positively reviewed by the reading community at large yeah and i just feel like as clunky and as info dumpy and as soapboxy and as plot convenienty as it can get i think that the difference for me is that while brandon sanderson's handling of magic systems is not always, but it's arguably most of the time a little more complete and well thought and nuanced. His people are not. And I think that the sort of truth books, the magic is like, it's it's decently well thought out. And like, <laughs> we're like, so why does this work here? Because he's special. <laughs> so like, it's like, there's some there's some very interesting magic concepts, but a lot of the time it's plot convenient. And I, I just think that when it comes to the people's responses to these things, their moral qualms, their the way that this tests their morality, that part of it, I do think is much 
better done than I've seen in the Sanderson books that I have read. And that's the part that I find much more compelling and that I care more about. And he does still a very good job with that in Blood of the Fold. Again, the delivery often in times of like very obvious plot development. Here's a magic thing that perfectly coincides with my theme. So them encountering this magic thing is going to make them ask the very moral question that I want them to. It's like, it's not the most nuanced or subtle, but I am more interested in humans encountering moral questions than in a magic thing for magic's sake. Yeah, I mean, like I do like high magic fantasy. So that you know, for me is fun in general. I but I I do think that what really makes these books work for me is the characters. I just I like I think he has a lot of really great, interesting, nuanced characters. And I think especially the way he writes a lot of his female characters is particularly interesting and and nuanced. And um, I think I'm will like I enjoy being with the characters enough that I'm willing to overlook some of the like plot holes or like conveniences or um you know in this book I think I rated it lower cuz like the pacing is just so all over the place and I was like what is the plot here <laughs> like what what actually is happening like am I enjoying some of these scenes with characters I like sure but like w- what are we doing I don't know um but yeah, I mean, I think that that's what really works. And I would agree. I mean, like, I enjoy Brandon Sanderson, I think more than you do in general. But I would agree. Like, I do. It's I also, not hard to say that you enjoy Brandon Sanderson. I mean, yeah, it's true. It's true. No, I, I, I enjoy him, you know, and I, and I enjoy the stories he tells. And I think his characters are fine. But I would agree that I don't think they're as good as Good Kind's characters either. And, um, like, and he, I wouldn't, he's I mean, better at, he's better at world building, I think. Um, Sanderson? Yeah. Well, and this is where, again, like, it depends but... on how you define world building, because the part of Brandon Sanderson's worlds that never work for me are the people that populate them. And, like, that's not not part of your world. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I when guess, people like, say that's... world building, I'm like, the culture that exists in your world and the way yeah. that it would respond to the existence of this magic is part of your world. <laughs> but I think a lot of that is so much drawn on your background with anthropology. Like, you have a very specific lens you're coming at it from. And I get what you're saying, and I don't think you're wrong. But I, I think I get on better with his world building because I have a background that's more in like politics. And so because of that, like that is really interesting. Like what he does with science and politics is interesting. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's- but I also realized like after <laughs> I finished my little tirade that I low key sounded like I was explaining why he's correct when Terry Goodkind says that I don't write fantasy, I write stories about morality and philosophy, and I sometimes <laughs> use magic to accomplish that. And I was like, I kind of just made a case for that. You kind so of the ghost yeah. who lives in my apartment is currently cheering me on. <laughs> um, but I mean, okay, so like, I mean, real talk, like, mm-hmm. I, I, oft, I mean, I've often said, like, I don't think he's lying if he says that that's what he imagined that he was doing. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think he went and wrote a fantasy book and then retroactively was like, I'm actually writing a story about morals and philosophy. Like, no. I know, I, I believe that in his mind, that's what he was doing. I also think that he just went around pissing people off a lot <laughs> and that he chose to say things in the most inflammatory, the most polarizing and the most like non palatable way possible. Because like, yeah. if you imagine a well-loved author, like fuck it, Brandon Sanderson, if Brandon Sanderson, if someone was like, what's your secret? How do you write so goodly? Um, if he was like, well, it's because when I write fantasy, I don't really approach it in my mind as fantasy. You know, I just really think of it as like a story about truth and about morals, about like philosophies that interest me. And then like, you know, is ma- magic is a way that I like, that's how I do it. Like, that's how I create the story that I want to tell. You know, if Brandon Sanderson says something like that, I would be like, that's why he's the greatest. But Terry Good kind of was like, I don't write fantasy. <laughs> I write philosophy. And everyone's like, fuck you. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> it's true. I mean, I think you're, I think you're right. I think people just like, don't like him because of how he says stuff, which I think is hilarious. But you're, I mean, you're not wrong. Like you can see it from book one that like, clearly he was intending to write something about philosophy and politics. Like it is clear that that was always part of his intention. Now, I think he was also writing fantasy novels. Yeah. And like, again, not to be a total apologist for him, but like, I also think that 
the time in which he was writing this, fantasy as a genre was a lot more derided and a lot more just like it's Tolkien derivative nonsense for That's children. True. And That's so true. then I think in his mind, either and I also I mean, I don't know what exactly he was responding to. And I don't just mean like the person asking a question. I mean like what general conversation zeitgeist he was responding to. But like the 90s was not a great time for being like out and proud for like reading and writing fantasy. It wasn't like yeah. nerd culture was mainstream like it is now. So if you I don't know if he thought that he wouldn't be taken seriously, that his books wouldn't be read seriously if they were just like, this is basically just like Dungeons and Dragons, you know, that like, this is nonsense, like adults yeah. who never grew up and wanted to read about make-believe. Right. Like, I don't, he clearly did not go about it the right way, but I'm, I have no doubt in his mind, he thought that that's what he was doing and thought that he was you know it was afraid that like people were just like making fun of his books which then ended up be turning into them making fun of his books because he said that yeah <laughs> didn't kind of bit him in the butt yeah i mean i think this is true but i also think that what liana is saying is is accurate that like the world has changed dramatically from the early 90s the early to mid 90s like like nerds were still picked on they weren't mainstream culture you know like our our just like our cultural thinking about fantasy and sci-fi and stuff like that has shifted so far since then um that i do kind of get it and like, also i would just like to say that there are fantasy books that are shelved in literary fiction because they're not considered bullshit fantasy no this is literature that and is i true. think like that yep. they get away with it and they don't get called out for that and no one is saying that they're above being called fantasy meanwhile terry goodkind is like trying to get the same accolades for his books and it's like mm -hmm. i am writing stories about people not fantasy and like he gets shat on for that i mean i agree like he yeah clearly does not present things in a <laughs> way that it is great for getting people on your side <laughs> but like i I get how that happened. But also, isn't that, like, the most libertarian way of him to approach it? <laughs> it's like, I'm t I mean, like, like that is 100% how, like, libertarian well, dudes talk about and stuff. also, 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 <laughs> the idea of authors being good at PR is a very new idea. That is also Like, authors, so like, true. we're ornery, reclusive hermits who could just write their books and never, never be seen, and that was probably for the best, because, like, I don't think Tolkien doing the PR circuit would have done him any favors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's just, I, so I think that's the thing, it's like, people still get so up in arms about that, and I'm like, look, it was a different time. And he was the kind of person who would enjoy pissing people off. And also, I'm just like, okay, if you don't agree, uh, and I mean, I don't, if you don't agree with, like, Ayn Randian type of philosophy, which he was enamored of, like, I yeah. get you being like, mm, I don't yeah. know about that. Yeah. But his worst offense is just being kind of rude. <laughs> like, he, it, when we see all the things that come out about authors, that the worst thing people could dig up about Terry Goodkind was that he was, like, kind of rude when people interviewed him, and it was kind of like... <laughs> inflammatory about how he described his own books like but that's it I'm like i'm definitely a lot more okay with that than a lot of other things well and i mean the fact that like we read these books and i'm like they're they're very feminist especially for the time that they were written they're like you know, I mean, like, sometimes we're like, did a woman write some of this? Like, or at least beta read this? I don't like, know. Verna and Warren, I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure your wife didn't write this? I mean, I feel like his wife, wife must have been, like, a part of his process. Because, like, they're so feminist in the way that, like, they talk about things. They're all, and they also are just, I mean, there's the whole thing with, like, the way he dealt with the queer characters in this mm -hmm. book. Like, there's just so much stuff in them. And to I don't know. I, i'm not purposely like again i brandon sanderson is a, seems like a very nice person and i'm I so happy for him and everybody loves these books and like i just i'm happy for you like i really don't <laughs> i'm not trying to take him down <laughs> but for me personally when i have read sanderson's books um versus when i've read terry goodkind's books as much as i've like 
I've it's not like I'm like Terry Goodkind is perfect. I frequently call out, I'm like, okay, this scene was like it's a little weird. Why is this here? Or yeah. like that wasn't well written, or like the prose was like very not good here, or that seems convenient. Like I, I don't sit here talking about him as if he's like he's no Joe Abercrombie. Um but I have no matter how eh, I feel about things in good kind books, no matter how weirded out, like Temple of the Winds, I often I mean, as we'll get to it next month, like I that's the one I always call out is like that one was like, why did that have to happen at all? <laughs> but nothing that Terry Goodkind has written that I've read has ever offended me. And I have read things by Brandon Sanderson that have offended me. And that's <laughs> just, that's all I have to say about that. Interesting. And, you know, we're all different about things with it. But, yeah. Yeah, I do. I do think he's you know, underappreciated, which is why we're doing, I mean, which is honestly is why we're doing this. Um, I don't even think underappreciated. I mean, like, isn't how I would put it because like, it's, I mean, I appreciate his books, but I just think I don't, I'm not out to make sure everyone appreciates him. I I would just accept them not shitting on him. Yeah. (laughs) You don't have to like him. I'm not asking you to like him. I would like you to stop acting like he's the worst writer that ever put pen to paper when like, that's not the case. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, people being like, he's such a hack. And I'm like, is he though? Like, I mean, I just, yeah, I just disagree. Like, I don't think he does everything perfectly. He's certainly got his problems, but I think there are some things he does excellently. Um, Which is why we're doing this. Excited for (laughs) Temple. Honestly, at this point, I think it's been such, it's like built up in my mind as such a like, that like when I read Temple of the Winds, I'll be so ready for it that it'll be like. I'm, I'm actually curious to see because like it like I remember I feel like I have mixed feelings about it because like when I read it, I was like, this is weird. But also I I don't want to say anything specific about it yet. But like also I think there's an argument to be made that it could be also in the vein of like feminism. Well, when I did my little video essay i say that because for the ones in my life i scripted something um (laughs) talking about the sort of truth books pros and cons and why they personally work for me Mm -hmm. um like without going because i it wasn't vague and non-spoilery as a video but like what i was thinking of a lot when i was in my section about how um when he does you know sex stuff and things like that that like it's both uh, like a pro and con gray area because like con i don't like how much it's in there and I often don't like exactly how he's going about it because it's just like kind of weird. And it's like, I don't like it. <laughs> but the reason it doesn't bother me in a way that would make me go, I cannot with this author, mm-hmm. is that the, the what, he, what he's ultimately in his roundabout weird kind of gross way <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> the point he's driving at at the end of the day is most of the time something that at least in broad strokes, I would agree with. And so then he goes about it in a way sometimes that I'm just like, I I don't know why that needed to happen the way that it did. Like, I swear you could do this in a way that's not so weird. (laughs) You can make the same point, but I'm not going to hate you. And I can't say that you are a problematic author when the point that you were trying to make in this super weird way (laughs) was one that I ultimately agree with. Right. Well, that's what I think is interesting is because like I've read reviews from some people who get really creeped out by the way he deals with sex, which like fair, like it is weird, but like talk about it as if it's just like 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 the a creepy version of the male gaze and I just don't think that that's true like I think you can totally be weirded out by the sex stuff he includes in his books like some of it is is validly weird (laughs) um but a lot of it is done pretty intentionally like I just disagree I just fundamentally disagree with the idea that it's just like a creepy version well, of the male gaze. You know? I guess I just if someone has such a huge problem with it then there's a lot of better books that are better books or at least better regarded that you better have a problem with too because like they have not only weird sex things but those weird sex things are not even driving at a message right. that is in any way like feminist or right. about you know rights or about anything like that and he's always driving it at some kind of a message like that so like if you have a problem with his sex stuff then you better tell me that you also hate guy gabriel k that you also hate um andre sapkowski that you also hate um those are the two that come to mind but i'm just yeah like you better also have a problem with that yeah um 
Because at least when he does it, he's trying to, yeah, like, I agree. Like, he's trying to make a point. He's subverting gender norms or he's I like. Mean, okay, I love Patrick Rothfuss and I love the King Killer Chronicle. But honestly, there is no defending Felorian. There's like, no defending No Fulorian. defending that. The that only is, possible no. defense for that is, like, a shoddy, like, fun narrative one that's, like, Foth is an unreliable narrator. So, of course, he would say it this way. But, like, he's not yeah. making a point. He's not trying to make a point. It's just, like you put those here for yourself sir and in the song of ice and fire like in the later books in particular there are times where like for the most i mean for the most part the show is a lot more sexual so when people talk about those books and they talk about how sexual they are i'm like i think you've only seen the show because like they're, mm -hmm. they aren't actually that sexual mm -hmm. um but in the later books there are a few times when there's like a sex more sexual scene mm -hmm. and it feels a little voyeuristic and you're just mm -hmm. like i don't know that I, I don't know what the point of that was yeah like, it doesn't ruin it, and it's not where I'm just going, this was disgusting and un unacceptable. It's just kind of like, okay, George, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, like, and they're not, there isn't any point to it. Like, it's not a scene where I'm like, I don't know why that had to happen that way, but I get what you're going for. I don't yeah. get what you're going for. Why is this here? Whereas the Terry Good Kind books, I'm like, I don't know why you chose to do it this way, <laughs> but I do know the point you're trying to make, and, like, that we can agree on. Yes. <laughs> Yes, hundred percent. Um, yeah, like I can't I can't think of anything where it just feels like purely voyeuristic or purely objectifying. Like I that's And it is pretty equal opportunity. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, and honestly I appreciate that. Like if you're gonna have sexual violence in your world, make it equal opportunity for men and women. And like you do, like he does. It everybody everybody is victimized. <laughs> like and I mean, I also, okay, so like having a fish out of water character to have world building explained to is a tired thing that like gets made fun of for, for mm -hmm. how convenient that is that, oh, your character doesn't know anything. So everybody can explain things to them. So like, obviously Richard does serve that purpose, but I love that he serves that purpose more often for like cultural and sexual and gender norms. Like, yeah. yes, he gets magic explained to him, but other characters also get magic explained to them. Mostly he's like, I lived in a forest hut my whole life and have never heard of other cultures. And so <laughs> that's the kind of fish out of water he is where he's yeah. like a good guy who's like, but I don't understand why anybody is different from me in any way. Yeah. And has Kaylin around and Zed around and the mud people around and do Shilu around to be like, you're silly for thinking yeah. your way is the only way. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Um, yeah yeah i mean y yeah i agree it's interesting maybe patrick wanted to go explain how he went into adult yeah no no it's like it's the most ridiculous i'm like you could do that but in a lot less pages oh there's so many pages it goes on for so long and it's long. also the fact that like a much more interesting plot development or, or not plot development, but like a much more exciting thing happens off screen. We just get told that it just happens so that we can spend more pages <laughs> with Valorian. And I'm like, yeah. you know what? We could have switched those. Yeah. Like, we could have. Well, honestly, the other thing is that I'm like, I'm like, you're going to tell me that a young man who has never been with a woman is somehow magically the most amazing person in bed that like even is, the most experienced like i just i that's just why my favorite explanation is no. that both is an unreliable narrator so he just like told his story where he's a sex god and i'm like yeah. that's the only explanation that i will accept for this i mean honestly i think that is the only thing that makes any sense but i just think it's so ridiculous <laughs> yeah yep <laughs> jessica I do think it's funny though because it is 100% the sort of thing that like dudes would fantasize about that like I'm just gonna be so amazing and I'm like oh for Quoth I'm like yeah with Quoth like because I, I yeah or like guys who think that they are and I'm like are you though really <laughs> like, this is why I very very much enjoy Abercrombie sex scenes <laughs> They're gross. You have to be realistic. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. There's Abercrombie. All right. Well, I feel like we have uh, pretty, pretty thoroughly talked about 
Blood of the Fold and our um also Terry Good Guide. I feel like I feel we're like, like the of protectors the of Good Guide. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, like every time I read these books, like I it's this constant, you know, like, is this, you know, perfect? No, like there's things that I'm like, oh, that's kind of silly. But also yeah. running in my mind is all the time just like this, this really isn't that bad. Like people need to oh. Yeah. And a lot of it's fun. I mean, like three and a half stars is not a bad rating, right? I mean, like this I was is... say, and also, also, as much as people like to act like he's the worst thing that ever happened and no one likes him, clearly they do because he kept writing tons of books that sold millions of copies and they turned it into a TV show before anybody else got a TV show. So, like, you know, haters gonna hate. I do low key think, and I know you and I talked about this previously, but like, I, I low-key think part of it is probably misogyny because it's been yeah. interesting doing this and like I mean you can see it when our we chat. first said that I was like I could see that and the more I've thought about it and the more I read these books with that in mind the more I'm like that's it yeah that's it right there yeah. bingo yeah. yeah well because like we we like we announced this and like you see the people in our chat I mean most of my my audience is like female anyway but um just in general I feel like most of the people that we've heard from have been like oh my god like I love good kind or I've always and most of them are women and so I think and I think it's because he does write these books that are pretty deeply feminist and but I mean to be to be fair to the opposite gender yeah um I in my the video that I did just about you know overview and pros and cons yeah and why you know I personally do like it um I have had a lot of comments from like judging by the username I would I think is as male commenters mm -hmm. who like the books and were like I have I've read these for years they are yeah. my favorite fantasy series this was my intro to fantasy and like yeah. thank you for not shitting on it <laughs> and I'm like yeah well and like a guy introduced me to them when I was like a yeah. teenager so like I mean I it's not like across the board but I think arguably part of where that came from and why there's a cohort of people who like to hate on it is probably such I was going to say, I think misogyny is, I think, I mean, we talked about this before and like, we're going to talk about it every single live and I'm fine with it because like, we're balancing all of the shit talk. Yeah. Um, but like, it's a combination of factors that it was a perfect storm of why a fandom would turn against him. And so like, he wrote something that is leaning towards female tastes and female gaze and feminism, not entirely, but it's got like enough of that in there more than others do. And then he was not appreciative of his fans he was kind of a dick and in, like interviews and was like very sort of not saying and doing the right things to show appreciation for his readership mm -hmm. so that combination made people think the worst of him at all times and interpret everything he does in the worst possible way whereas i mean there's also something to be said for the fact that like women have to learn how to make allowances for men their entire lives and <laughs> So, like the fact that we're more recent willing to give him the benefit of the doubt of like well he might just be the because like i know men like that i know men who are like really great guys underneath but like you get them talking about stuff where they're feeling like being jerks and they'll like say shit like that like because they just are ornery I mean, well but also you know? like so the one uh quote unquote um valid criticism you know was the whole he's into Ayn Rand and so like originally when I would talk about that or and even in that video when I addressed it I was like okay but like I mean maybe he thought you would read these books and you would get like you know indoctrinated into Ayn Rand ideas off of his books but I never read them that way and I don't think that they read that way because when you read fantasy books like I don't think that the kinds of power structures in fantasy books are like I'm meant to read that and go oh that's how our government should be right and the example that I would often use because it's you know the most ubiquitous fantasy example out there is Lord of the Rings and be like, I don't read that and go, oh, we should have the rightful king return to Gondor. Like, I don't read that and go like, oh, that's how government should be. Like, no, right. like it's a fantasy book. So like if a fantasy hero is like, we should fight and I should be the one and only chosen. I'm like, yeah, it's a fantasy book, I, whatever. Um, but at the same time, like I mainly use that example because, you know, Tolkien's so well known and so well regarded and blah, 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 blah. But quite frankly, like if you're going to tell me that you can't read a fantasy book by somebody who liked Ayn Rand's ideas and then unless you're Catholic, then you better not be reading J.R.R. Tolkien's work because his Catholic views and his Catholic like values are present in Lord of the Rings. They are not they not are. there and That's they are true. just as much there as the 
influence of Ayn Rand on, on Terry Goodkind. So if that's your reason, that's perfectly valid, but you better not be reading any author that has any views different from yours. <laughs> uh, yep. Um, I'll get off my soapbox now. Okay. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. I do feel like we, we, we say this a lot, but it, you know, it's worth, it's worth saying. We're, we're I just like... get angry about it. The more we read these books or is that just the yeah. more I, like it germinates? Cause at first it was like, Oh yeah, maybe that's why they hate him. And I'm like, that is why they hate him. And I hate that they hate him for that. And I'm really yeah. angry about it. Yeah. 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 I mean, because they're like, they're good books. I, I, I still really want to know about the new editions that are supposedly coming out this fall well they're coming out this fall <laughs> i know but i there's no covers released i want to know what the covers are going to look like so like tour is you can pre-order trade paperbacks of these books for september but there's no okay so no instead images of I think we did i think we did fan casting before if we did like fan covering like in your perfect world these new covers what would they look like Oh, I don't know. Um, hmm. I feel like if they're going to do anything, they'd probably like modernize it in some way. Cause like, I mean, there's still quite a f variety of modern fantasy cover aesthetics to choose from. Yeah. Cause Sanderson covers actually are very old school. Like the Stormlight True. covers look like they belong in the nineties. Well, they do their own covers they yeah sanderson's company makes the like does the art well dragon steel but tor publishes the stormlight archive yes but they get the art and the cover design from dragon steel so it's mm. not like they're doing it in-house um so it is a little a little different but uh well, people are excited about this richard would look like richard yes that's if richard's on the cover many fantasy books do not nowadays have characters on them Unless, because that's why I thought. I mean, Sanderson covers look very like in line with the Terry Goodkind covers of having yeah. a dude who's from that's the book who's doing the thing that is in the book. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think like what's like a good comp title for like high. I feel like a lot of high fantasy stuff that's coming out now has like icons or like images or something. Well, like Jen Lyons series is like right a horse, an octopus. Maybe you could have like some of the some of the creatures. So you could have like Scarlet, uh, Gar. I don't know. Um, the well, I the, think because it's the, the Sword Mris of Truth, the Mriswith. <laughs> I think because it's the Sword of Truth series, each cover might have a different rendition of the sword being surrounded by something relevant to the book. Oh yeah, that would be cool. So like in the first one, the sword would be. Maybe the, the boxes of ordinary around it or something like that. And the second one, there's like des like deserts and the stone is like above the sword or something. And in this one, mm -hmm. like some stylized merse with around it and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. Or maybe like a Radahan on book two. Well, that would just be a circle. <laughs> well, but it's like a collar. I don't know. Like an open It's just like one. a circle of metal. Yeah. But like an open one. Because it, I don't know. I think it could be interesting. Yeah. I think it would be it would be kind of cool. That's the most sort of like modern yeah. version. That I, I think, think that would of. be yeah. I think that would be more modern. Love if they kept the illustrative styles, but with accurate character representation. I could see that. Um, just get just use Chris Hemsworth and Ava Green as your models. <laughs> Her boss. There's also a lot of present day fantasy titles yeah. that do just like the title itself is like mm -hmm. artistically rendered where it doesn't yeah. really have like a picture. Yeah. Or, um, like if you look at Abercrombie's and Hobbes books, the UK covers, like they're yeah. very minimalist. And it's just like the title with like a little bit of like flourish. They have, they have like a reach. Yeah. I guess for UK, that's more of a UK thing though. Um, I do feel like having creatures on fantasy books is a big thing, though. But it, it's either, like, you can have one where, like, creature is front and center, this is mm -hmm. the cover, or it's the title, and it's, like, coming off one of the letters, and it's like, I'm a creature coming off the H. <sighs> yeah. I guess I feel like for U.S. stuff, I've seen more that's, like, that. Um, 
or if they did like architecture of some sort like buildings that are important yeah that would be honestly cool. if they had the covers um that look similar to the long price quartet covers but they were you know places from sort of yeah series. that would be cool i'd be into that i mean if they because like for book one they could do um like the 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 Rawls Palace in Dahara or something maybe. Mm-hmm. Um and then the Palace of the Prophets. Yeah. Palace of the Prophets and then the maybe the um, Iden Drill. Iden Drill, something in Iden Drill. That would be cool, actually. I would be and then you could integrate a creature. You could do like a a, a that that okay, that's what I want. That's that's what I want for covers. I want architectural locations integral to the books and a creature. Which is kind of what they were doing, like with the the Wizards First Rule cover that was already the updated one from the original cover. Mm-hmm. The original one is like Zed and the dragon and all that, and then the new one is like very distant. You can see like teeny tiny Richard and Galen yeah. for the waterfall. It's kind of already going that way, where it's right. like there's a place. Because I think that's but it's more like to be like, but it's more like landscape than building. Yeah, but there's a lot of places. Yeah. In, I mean, especially for the first book, I think that for the first book they are mostly like in nature, a questing. So like if they're hardly at the the they're hardly in dahara in the first book yeah john gwyn like covers yeah that's pretty that's true that's pretty more minimalist with like an item creatures cities yeah the map on the cover yeah i i think i think you just don't for adult high fantasy you just don't get a lot of people on the cover unless it's sanderson yeah Hmm. okay well there you go if Tor is listening and they haven't made None the covers yet. None of them can yet. be worse than the original <laughs> Temple of the Winds cover, which, like, I mean, it's the weirdest book and it has the worst cover, so. It's not a great cover. That's true. He looks the least <laughs> like Richard on that cover. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, trends and covers are, in, are like, an interesting, an interesting thing, so. Yeah, well, and also the assumptions people make. So, like, it, it's interesting to me. I was thinking about this because I just got done reading um, The Blood Trials by Annie Davenport, which is, I keep talking about it because I love it. It's fantastic. If you like Red Rising, you should go pre order it. But um, looking at Goodreads, like, a lot of people are categorizing it as YA. It is, like, not YA at all. And I low key wonder if it's because there's an illustrated person on the cover and, and the person like, is a female and the person is a female and Bingo. so I, yeah and so i think because of that people are assuming it's YA, but it's like gritty and violent like red rising <laughs> like it's not yeah but the covers of red rising <sighs> yeah they don't have people on the cover so i think like as beautiful as i think that cover is i do think in terms of marketing it's probably doing it a disservice which is unfortunate because it's really good um, yeah, I was going to say, like, um, honestly, if Sword of Truth had covers more similar to the Devabod trilogy, where it's not even a whole place, it's like doorways to yeah. a place. Like, if you had. Oh, this is a really good point. Have you seen the recent bind up of Children of Dahara? So it's like, I think, like, kind of a whitish color with just a, like, a, like a, a rune or something in the middle. It sounds awful. <laughs> Yeah, it's not, you're right. It is underwhelming. It's not a great cover. I do, I kind of hope that's not the direction that they go for the rest of the series, but you, you, that is, that seems possible. That would be unfortunate. Why are we never consulted about these things? I know, right? They should consult us. Yeah. (sighs) One of these days, they'll realize. I would love to get... I will say if if they do decent covers of the trade paperbacks, I'm probably going to want to get them because I prefer trade paperbacks and like if they have good covers for these books. Yeah. Oh, it's not because I prefer trade paperbacks. I just if there's a book I like and there are multiple editions that I like, <laughs> then I will get them. It's also true. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see what Tor does. Hopefully we'll we get will. a cover reveal sometime. I mean, we will at the very least see it on the day of release. <laughs> yeah, I should find. Okay, let me so we can like show people what I'm talking about with the children of Dahara thing. Let me find it. If by people you mean me, uh, I also you don't and, know you and the people in the chat. I contain multitudes. 
oh yeah like all of these look kind of hold on oh okay the bind up this is not what i was thinking of this isn't actually as bad as what i was thinking i was thinking of the original children of jafar ones okay hold on let me uh, let me share my share my screen um okay so yeah so this is the bind up it's not great it's not great it is underwhelming but it's, I mean, but it's, but this is, this is what the original ones kind of looked like. Oh, shoot. Not There's an apostrophe good. between the D and the H. Yeah, but if you type that into Goodreads, it doesn't like register. It's weird. I tried that earlier. So yeah, these had kind of like this. I don't know. It's not even a rune, I guess. It's more like just... I actually like that better. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, they you, the, that is a good point, though. That may end up being the direction that they go. I, I would prefer if they um, if they did something else, but uh, could that be my Radahan on that? It, I, it could. The circle is a Radahan. <laughs> it could. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, this is why I showed both of them. That's, yeah. Hey, we'll since see. they're such girly books, they should go with a Crescent City type of aesthetic. They should. Jessica, good point. Yeah, so these books are on Kindle Unlimited right now. So if anybody has Kindle Unlimited, you can read the ebooks for free, basically. I noticed that. And I think if you get, if you download the ebook through Kindle Unlimited, you can add on the audiobook for a discounted price so just every different kind of narrator that they got on board in fact okay uh, re-release covers that's great and all i would like a cohesive audiobook series that would be nice with one narrator <laughs> that would be great actually if they like redid the audiobooks and if it could be steve west please and thank you <laughs> or stephen pacey but he's just like so first law that like he's it would be also just really talented. I know, but I feel like Steve West as the voice of Richard would be like I could see that. I could see that. Um honestly, yes. I that would be fun. It would be fun to see that kind of art of these characters. I think I it would wish, work, honestly. I think it would too. I wish I was more artistic. I mean, someone needs to do like fan art of uh some of these. Oh, they're on script. Awesome. Yeah, they should redo the audiobooks. That would be great. They just redid the Lord of the Rings ones with Andy Serkis. Yeah, but that's like, because people like Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I know. People like these <laughs> I mean, if books. by that same token, then they'll just get one of the, what, uh, Craig, what's his name, who played Dark and Rawl in the show? I mean, actually, he'd be good. He has, he has a nice voice. So if he wanted to re-record all the audiobooks, I'd be for it, but. Yeah. Okay, well, we I feel it? like I think we've covered it. <laughs> We're going to be over on Liana's channel next month to talk about Temple of the Winds. You Temple. don't want to miss it. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. <laughs> it is a memorable book. It is indeed. Even though Faith of the Fallen is my favorite, the one I remember the most vividly <laughs> is Temple at least, of the Winds. At least, at least part of it. <laughs> should be should be interesting. actually i remember most of temple of the winds very well like the plot line that leads up to the temple of the winds i also remember that because it's also weird yeah yeah i don't know i maybe not don't remember it as well as you do but i definitely remember quite i think it'll come so. back to you it, it probably unlock, i mean it probably will honestly it will unlock those rooms of your mind palace and you'll be like no close it close it close you know it. what <laughs> You're, you're, yeah, I mean, you are probably correct. When are we doing uh, the 29th? Yeah? Um, I believe you, if that's what we said. Sort of truth. I think that's right. No, the 29th is your um, readathon. No, that's the 22nd. I keep mess messing that up. 
But you told I, me I the told, last. I did tell you that, and I, and was I put wrong. it in my account. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I was wrong. The readathon is the 16th to the 22nd, and the live show for the readathon is the 22nd. Okay. So I don't know. I'm ours sorry. can be the 29th. Ours can be the 29th. <laughs> I just have to figure out when I'm doing Ship of Magic read of the live show. It's just such an I'm, emotional roller coaster. I I'm sorry. So. It's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um Yeah, Temple is Temple is wild. It surely is. You were right. I don't even know why I didn't DNF the series after that, but I was just like, okay, well, thank you next. Yeah. I kept going for a while. So yeah. Uh, Yeah. So night of the 29th, we'll be back with Temple of the Winds. And for those, oh, I have it. Excuse me. I actually do have it on my calendar. I just need to actually confirm this with the people that I'm doing it with, but I tentatively will do Mad Ship Live on the 21st and then Tor.com-a-thon Live on the 22nd. So you might get like back-to-back live shows on my channel for everybody. Um, but we'll be on Leanna's channel for Sword of Truth on the 29th. So we will see you next month. The whole Thanks, month everybody. to be traumatized. It'll be great. <laughs> you know, have a therapy session. It'll be fine. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next month. Bye, guys.